Hello and welcome to the Build the Soil Family Farms YouTube series. This is making a ferment part two. Everything is done. We're gonna be testing the pH today. We've got Miles here to answer some of your questions. Well, I've opened it just a couple times to check on it. I've been around a lot of ferments over at Build the Soil, so I can tell that the, that smell is there. I think in between making the ferment and today, we've had Miles has come out one other time and we checked on it a little bit. It was still sweet, smelled like molasses still. So we knew that we were getting somewhere, but it wasn't where we needed it to be. So we're three weeks out today and just ready to give you all an update on that. Well, we're gonna open it up. Like you said, we can already sense the smell coming out of there. It's kind of a bitter, like cidery, nasty smell unlike the sweetness we saw we had before so we're going to open it up and we're going to drop the ph meter in there and give us a reading and see where it's at we're going to talk about the uses of it and do some faq right yeah uh, i know that you guys have a lot of questions i personally have a lot of questions as soon as we know that this is ready to go we're going to go through some of those questions and answer them i mean to me it really doesn't it smells not good but it doesn't really smell terrible to me it smells it smells like, it still has a sweetness, but not a molasses sweetness, like yeah, a cidery definitely. sweetness. It's a little bit of dirty feet. Yeah, there's a funkiness to it, um, like a cheesy almost, yeah, we'll like a cheesy it. cider that has like a plant element to it, a decomposing um, yeah. fecundity, richness, and, and for, it smells fertile to me. Yeah, definitely. Um, so just based off the smell, Miles, do you think it's ready? Yeah, judging by the smell and by the pellicule, which is this uh, film on top that we're getting, the bubbly white film is a bacterial pellicule that separates the anaerobes, the facultative anaerobes from air. So judging by that look and by the smell, but let's check the pH. You could use just like the strips that you buy at like Ace Hardware or whatever. Um, I didn't go get any of those, but we do have this pH reader here. It's an electronic one. All right, so we're just gonna stick it in there. Yep. And we can see it dropping immediately. We're at 4.2, 4.1. We're gonna give it a little bit more depth and get it down there in the, in the tank a little bit more. And as we do that, it's probably right about halfway in at this point, right in the middle. I would say you wanna get a reading of the center of it. Um, you don't wanna, you know, test one side or the other because the top has this pellicule and the bottom has like a yeasty layer, kind oh. of, that's a, a sediment that's just all byproducts of the fermentation. So you don't want to be basically right on the bottom or testing right at the top either. Right, which is kind of an issue. Some Even the even the bottom is usually fine with me because you, you're usually drawing out of the bottom of these big tanks. Sure. Well, this okay. this is the, the what we're looking for. 3.3, I usually say 3.5 is optimal. 3.3 is fine. It's probably just because it's been out here in the sun getting warm. What if it was lower? I've never seen it really go below two, but yeah, it's fine. It's just okay. more acidic and we need to remember that with dilution, okay. which is one of our main questions is how to use it. And dilution is one to four ounces per gallon. Now, if you're using it in your garden on your plants, that's the range you want to stay at, one to four ounces per gallon. And you can use it foliar spray within that range too. Always start low and work your way up. So start at one ounce a gallon, even a half ounce a gallon if you'd like, and work your way up. Um, if you're using it on the compost piles to accelerate decomposition, you can use it at, different, at higher rates of dilution. You could use it at um, you know, 20 to one. Um, you could even take, if you have excess of this stuff, and you just need this tank and need to use it and you've used most of this up, you can just dump the whole tank right in the, you can put it undiluted onto a compost pile. You might want to turn it after that and give it some treatment, but um, that's, that's kind of our range of usage is from the, what's recommended on the bottle at one ounce to four ounces a gallon, all the way up to really strong use just for the purpose of decomposition in a compost pile or in a manure pile, an old leaf pile, something like that. Okay, so since we're on that subject, I guess my question for you now would be how often could I, so you talk about a home garden and say you were doing the four ounces per gallon and you just got like some roses out there. I mean, how often would you rec recommend that we put it would, on our garden? I would stick to one time a week. If you do it every other week, you know, that's where the dilution rates kind of vary where it's, if you're giving it more often, give a lower dose. Sure. And if you're, gonna, if you're gonna say, oh, I know I probably won't use this for a couple more weeks, 
go on up to four ounces a gallon and give it to them. And that, that way you can kind of vary that. Another thing I didn't mention is a field application. So if you're, go, if you're out in a field, I say 10 to 30 gallons per acre. So that depends on how you're diluting, what you're using to water, and the regularity of how you're using it. Okay, yeah, because that's something we're gonna be doing here, is we have this filter machine outside and basically it'll siphon out of a bucket and we can pick the ratio of water to solution. I'm gonna wanna end up putting it outside. So I was curious, it's about an acre out there. So when you say 30 to 40 gallons, is that total including water or that's just the total I would put on? Yeah, that's the total. I would say if you put a five gallon bucket of this out there to siphon off of, if you put it at like one to a hundred or like about an ounce to a gallon, yeah. then that's plenty Pretty safe. in okay. the field. Yeah, and, and then it's just how much you use as you're watering. Sure. Okay, um, cool. So my, I have another question that just popped in to my mind and you talked about like having to maybe get rid of it and use this and whatnot. I know you have ferments over at build soil so how long can we store this for? Like if I just wanted to use some, keep it here until I'm ready to use some more, what would I do? So the best storage is in a cool dark place for long, for really long term use. If you, if you have a jug of it, say, and you want to store it and use it in a year, just keep it in a cool dark place. For this on the farm, it's about using it and it's not about storage. So, but, but since you're not moving this tank, the best thing you can do to keep it good longer would just be to cover it. Sure. Just like a tarp or a piece of duck cloth or a, yeah, yeah or, and it'll, that'll keep the temperatures kind of down on it a little bit. So, okay. but, um, but you're gonna be using this, you're gonna be going through it. Yeah. I urge you to put on, the comp, put on your compost okay. piles, even treat the pig bedding with it, like the pig manure piles. I know this smells bad, but pig manure smells bad and the lactic acid bacteria in this will help mitigate smells. Okay. This smell won't last when you water it into your garden. It's not like your garden's going to smell like this forever, especially once you dilute it. Okay. So diluting this and using it on anything that's decomposing, anything that smells bad, anything like that, it's going to decompose quicker. Okay, cool. I know we had a bunch of comments on YouTube or questions. So I thought maybe we could go through it while you're here and just talk about some of them. Let me get that pulled up. So I have one here. It's uh, from Tango Down 141. It says, can I make this minus the whey and EM1 with homemade lab instead? Yes, of course. You can use any of those. You don't need all of them. So if you only have homemade lab, perfect. If you okay. only have EM1, fine. If you only, as long as you're using one of those three or one of those lactic acid bacterias, you get the KNF lactic acid bacteria, your homemade ones, any, anything you can get. Awesome, great. There's even like equine inoculants for horses for lactic acid bacteria that people get syringes of it. You can get it like, you know, pet stores or something. Yes. So this was a good question here from Tony R. It says, can you replace the plant matter with insect frass using the same ratios to make a fermented insect frass? And what are the benefits of using an insect frass ferment? Yeah, our friends over at Growing Organic do that. They make an insect press, and you can use an insect press in this. You can use a lot of different things to, in this process, like amendments such as insect press. I remember way back when I first started doing this, I think I did a craft blend ferment of these, and I just used the craft blend. Remember, there used to be a really nice camelina meal here, here at Build a Soil that I used and fermented sometimes. Okay. Yeah, I've fermented a hulled hemp seed that I got cheap before. So yeah, you can do all kinds of different things. You want to, to, to say what the benefits of each one of those are is gonna take some R&D and some, some of your own tracking and experimentation. But to figure that out and to get an idea of it, you wanna look at the benefits of what you're fermenting and say, oh, I'm gonna kind of fast track those benefits. Right, which you touched on in our original video. You sure. definitely mentioned how beets have their own unique set of benefits and so using that for the farm would provide that so same way as whatever you're fermenting those are the benefits you can expect to see from the ferment that makes sense all right so we were kind of discussing this a little bit before we started the video this question in particular can i dilute whole milk oh this is from joey 420 can i dilute whole milk and apply it directly to my garden I have mostly flowers, azaleas, and roses, but I'm not sure if it'll help my garden, and hopefully you can give me some advice. I mean, you can. That's kind of an old school thing is watering your, or spraying milk on plants or watering it into plants. I say if you have milk, make labs. Make the lactic acid bacteria, which is very simple, 
it just takes time and staying on top of something over time, but it's really not hard. And if you have milk, if you have an abundance of milk, make labs. Well, I would say look up the uh, Chris Trump Korean natural farming stuff. I would say um, there's so much info about making your own homemade lactic acid bacteria. Yeah. It's, a, it's a super simple process and the information is widely available and it's been that, that process has been kind of a trade secret among horticulturalists for a long time and now it's, it's out fully. So I have, a, I have a question for myself in all this. So obviously I'm learning what the benefits here are of the lactic acid and the, all those things. What would be the purpose, because I've never even really heard that, of, of putting, like you said, it's an old school thing, of putting like milk directly into your garden. In my mind, it's a dairy product, and I'm like, I wouldn't put that near my garden. I've learned differently with this, but... People used to say to spray it on your roses for powder mildew or something like that, or there was like, there's old school tricks of it, but it contains lactic acid bacteria. And I'm not, I wouldn't take a jug of milk and pour it on your garden. Right. It's just like you're doing this. You would take it and dilute it. So. I would say one to four ounces of milk in a gallon of water, like you don't want much more than that. Dilute. If you have abundance of milk, like tons of it, put it in your compost pile. Right. Yeah, that's a great idea. Compost piles need to stay moisturized, so, and it don't matter if it's sp spoiled milk or what, like put it on the compost pile. Let the microbes work it out in the mix. Okay, cool. Thanks for answering that. That's for sure. This one is a really interesting question. I, I love it because obviously people are thinking outside of the box here. And this is Joe McCraw. <laughs> Thanks for your question. This is uh, Bill Soil and Miles. I'm really loving the knowledge that I'm learning. But one question. I live on lake, a uh, lake around June. We get a lot of seagrass and stuff in the water. I take a leaf rake and comb the grass around the pier. Is it, good, is it a good source for any tea or fermentation that he can make? I would say that's prime material for ferment. As long as it's not toxic, as long as you, you know, so you might want to do a tad bit of research on that, but if it's growing in a lake with life around it, if there's aquatic life around it, it's safe to go. And I would say that's going to be great because you're going to be introducing aquatic microorganisms into the mix. And, um, you know, they're probably not going to make out compete. There's no way they're going to out compete the labs with the sugar. But yeah, I think that's great material. And if the keys are fast growing, non-toxic and if you can get nutrient dense but grass is extremely nutrient dense often yeah. so i think that's a great idea and, and it's all about looking and seeing what you have around you yeah that's what impressed me about the question you know just noticing that and then thinking about using it exactly yeah i think that's great the only thing the only thing that we mentioned that would be an issue there is that you want to be concerned about salt so if you're in a brackish water area or in a he said a lake so you're probably good but always be concerned with salt content in the water that if you're using anything from brackish or salt water areas, you might want to rinse it or use lower dilution rate for the, use less plant matter in the mix so you're not putting too much sodium in there. I'm thinking, kind of relating it to kelp in my mind. Exactly. And so kelp is really just super rich in sodium, so. Yeah, it's hard to separate it at that yeah, point. Exactly. So I would just use less. I see Green Goddess on here. We see you, Julie. Thanks for always commenting and watching the videos. I've got maybe one more. Could you mix your cuttings with brown sugar and ferment for six days or so? And, and will it go through osmotic pressure and extract the liquid from any plant material? Okay, so that's a really cool question, but that's, um, I wouldn't say confused, but getting um, mixed up with this process, which uses water and lactic acid bacteria and the Korean natural farming ferments, which are just equal weights of plant matter and brown sugar. The differences is primarily is this one you seal up airtight and those you cover with a cloth or with a napkin and they're not airtight and they only go six or seven days and this takes longer. This takes two weeks. In this case, it went three weeks and it's fine. So there's a, the fermented garden inputs, there's a variety of them and they are not all the same. So this is fermented plant extracts, FPE. It is not the same as fermented plant juice or fermented fruit juice, FFJ and FPJ in the Korean natural farming world. Okay. So yeah, th there's a lot to learn about these things out there and a lot of uh, resources. You know, so just be on the look for, for dif those differences as you ma make them and tinker. I'm really excited to go apply this to the farm. I definitely now know how to do that. You know, my, myself and our, the employees here at the farm have always just been asking, you know, how are we going to di dilute this? Do we put it straight on? So I'm glad, you, you know, we answered those questions. Before we go, Miles, I was wondering, as you were talking, we have this 
pillowcase bag in here that we use to stuff all the plant material in. When I remove that, does that basically start the shelf life for this or do I leave it in here for, you know, as long as I'm gonna hold this? What do I do? Yeah, good question. Cause you could leave it in for a little bit for a couple more weeks. But if you're gonna store this, if you're gonna be using this tank for the next month, let's say, um, the best way to preserve shelf life and to kind of give the microbes a rest and get, get them ready for the soil is to remove that plant matter for long-term storage. If you're gonna be done with this thing in four weeks, sure. you're probably good to leave it in. But I'll tell you that what's in that bag is great. Plants love it, it's good in the compost pile. I right, top dress with, top it. Dressing with it. It's really nasty, but it's, it's top dressable. It's good in the compost pile. Um, so yeah, it's kind of up to you. you could, I would take it out if not now, then in the next few weeks. Okay. But yeah, that's kind of, like you said, it's the beginning of the shelf life. Because in my mind, I'm thinking like, as long as that's in there, it's still trying to keep doing its thing. When yep. you take it out, like you said, everything can kind of rest. And that would be when I cover it. Okay, cool. That's great information. Yeah, so I'm gonna try to do a video. As soon as we decide to apply this, I will definitely do another video, bring you guys in and show you exactly where we put it on the farm or how I've got my, my system out for the outdoor field. So I'm really excited to get that going. I'm so grateful you came out today because we had so many questions and now I know what to do with this on my farm. Same way, so grateful. This is an awesome opportunity that every, all of us work together and teach and learn and everything, share our experiences and go through the comments and everything. And I just can't tell you like how much I've learned just from these couple videos, you know. I've heard so much about it, but even like the, the um, plant, the fermented plant extract versus the juice, I would have never even known that was a thing. So in my mind, just like you said before, I just thought all fermented things were the same, but apparently they're not. And, and the way you create it is, has a different use, right? Right, like this isn't kombucha, this is, kombucha is a different culture, this is a different, so yeah. yeah, we're learning all these different things about it. And yeah, I mean, I'm stoked to see what you use them in the, the garden, because this, this, your farm is looking great. And Thank you so much. Yes, I'm stoked to be eating more it's out of here. Be, it's gonna be turfed up here soon. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty stoked, so. Thanks again. Well, yeah, so we're gonna close this up. I will definitely let you guys know when we're gonna be putting it on the farm. I'll bring you in on that. I'm super grateful that you all watched this video today. Thank you for all your questions and your comments. I'm really happy that just like I'm learning, you guys are too. So again, if you have any more questions, drop them at, at the bottom. If you have any more comments, we love to, to hear them. Again, thank you, Miles, for coming out here today. I'm so grateful. I know that you have your awesome clothing line. I've been seeing it all over Instagram. If you want any apparel, weedshouldtastegood.com is the spot. There's seed menus on there also and a lot of different garments. Thanks for the shout out. The best way to purchase any of my fermented plant extract products or the Korean natural farming line is through Build the Soil. So check them out. That's the place. Thank you and we'll see you on the next episode.